windows. That's weird. That's going to trip me up. I'm going to hide that out of the way. Uh, so moving forward, uh, hello, hey, Connor McCarter and Bill Ferguson over in the YouTube chat. That's the other chat that I keep an eye on. So if you're, uh, if you're not able to do Discord, which I think some people can't for various reasons, then uh, maybe head on over uh, to the YouTube chat. Pop in there. All right, uh, I'm going to move forward with this, which is our jobs board. Uh, it's jobs.adafruit.com. If you're looking for work, uh, you can head over here. That's what it looks like right there. That's jobs idea for to come. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything to go and look for work. It doesn't cost anything to post a listing if you're trying to uh, fill a position. Uh, you'll notice here in the uh, the jobs listing, there's some interesting stuff, including director of the Schupf Family Idea Lab in uh, Saratoga Springs, New York, at Skidmore College. They're looking for someone to uh, helm a uh, a lab, an idea lab, which sounds really interesting. There's also uh, some sort of contract work, remote contract work, like this uh, Arduino Uno R3 code uh, gig. Someone is looking to bring someone on uh, to do some water control applications inside of an Arduino uh, setup. So pretty neat. Uh, all right, let's see. Mike P. Oh, no bleeps and bloops, people say. I thought there were some. Did you not hear those? Those were playing, I thought. Did you hear them that time? Maybe no. Uh, so let's see, what else have we got? Um, I have a show on Tuesdays you may have heard of. It's this right here. It's called JP's Product Pick of the Week. And on that show, I take a look at a product. Sometimes it's a new one. Sometimes it's a oldie but goodie from our archives. Sometimes it's halfway in between those two descriptions. Uh, the show's usually about 15 minutes long. I take a look at the product. I give you some uh, info, some demos, how to use it, maybe some, uh, some code examples if that's relevant. And you get a big, huge discount during the show. So if you watch on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern time, for that period of roughly 20 minutes to a half hour of the show, uh, with a little buffer on the end there, any of the product of the week that you put in your cart is going to have a big discount on it. Uh, there's no coupon code to use. It's just going to be priced, priced to sell, uh, as we say, right there on our website. And uh, this week was 50% off on the Feather RP2040, which is just a tremendous bargain for a whole bunch of microcontroller. Uh, I like to do a little recap. Here's a one-minute recap of the show. Feather RP2040. So this is the feather that you want. It's first of all, the chip that's most available in the world right now, we think. Uh, it has USB-C on it. It has dual cores. It's a Cortex M0 Plus, uh, but running at sort of our M4 speeds. We got eight megs of RAM on there. Uh, we have the Stem QT quick port, so you can connect things up easily to it. There are 21 GPIO. It has two I squared C buses, two SPI buses. There are, uh, let me check my notes, 16 PWM pins on there. It has the built in battery charging. So, this is really a terrific board. Uh, it's kind of a go to board for projects for me right now. It's really nice uh, how this brings this compatible into uh, the Feather ecosystem. There's a NeoPixel built right on for status. Uh, so really terrific board, one of my favorites. It is the Feather RP2040. Yes, it is. Uh, so let's see what's next. Let me know, uh, by the way, in the chat, things you're using them for. I know that uh, people really like that board and uh, especially curious about people diving into the PIO world to do concurrent uh, things with two cores to do uh, individual sort of instructions just on a PIO. Uh, there's there's some advanced stuff that can happen with the uh, with the RP2040 based microcontrollers, and uh, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, hello, Maxcraft7050 over in the YouTube chat, and Wagon Loads Best Network Inc. kind of trooper Dale Etchells. Hello, thanks for saying hi, and thanks for stopping by, uh, and uh, thank you by the way. Uh, someone had said happy birthday to me for yesterday, so thank you. Yeah, yesterday was my birthday, and uh, 
I saw my shadow, so you get more winter. Sorry. All right. Uh, next up, how about this circuit Python Parsec? It's going to be a good one. Okay, so let me get set up here and then we'll, uh, we'll get moving with this. Here we go. For the CircuitPython Parsec today, I wanted to talk about using dictionaries inside of CircuitPython. So a dictionary is a type of a data structure sort of like a list, uh, but the really neat thing about it is that we can ask for values associated with certain keys. So what you'll see in my code here, here I've actually named things for what they are. Uh, dictionary is inside of these curly brackets, these different pairs of things like the text string blue, and then it has a related uh, value, which is a color value here, these numbers in parentheses. What I'm doing in code here is, you can see down at the bottom, I'm using user input, and it says right here, please type the name of a key from your dictionary. And then it tells me the names of the different keys in my dictionary. So I'll type in green. It says your entry matches a key in the dictionary. Uh, then it tells me what the value of that key is. In this case, the value of the, the green key is 0, 255, 0. Then I have it lighting up these NeoPixels here for, for a fun little effect. Uh, and then it moves forward and says, okay, try try another one. If I type, type something that doesn't exist in here, let's do red. That's not in that list. It says, oh, red, that entry is not in the dictionary, sorry. So how this works, the key thing here, uh, and pardon the pun about key thing, uh, but I'm calling the key whatever the user input is. So key equals input parentheses. So when I type something, the next thing that happens is I check if the key is in the dictionary. So that's a way to just look and see, does it match any of those entries for those first halves of those pairs? If it does, we print out a little statement, we take a pause, then we set the uh, value um, variable to be equal to the dictionary at that key. So that's actually grabbing that value. I'm also calling it value just so it's really clear what it is right here. Uh, then I print off a statement to let you know you've done the thing, uh, fill the LEDs with that value. So in that case, when I typed in, uh, let's do blue, it goes, it looks through the dictionary, are any of the keys named blue? It finds one, and then it sets that thing called value to be the value of the blue, or uh, yeah, the blue key inside of the dictionary, in this case, 00255, and then it lights up our LEDs. So it's a really nice way to work with a data structure, uh, calling things by name, and then getting their values returned to you. And so that's one way that you can work with dictionaries inside of CircuitPython, and that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Uh, and by the way, so I was not fishing for, for, for happy birthdays, so no, uh, no oops is necessary. Thanks, Connor McCarter, for saying oops belated happy birthday. No problem. I wasn't going in and advertising that, but I saw, saw that someone had mentioned it. Uh, more coffee. Hold on. Yeah, so... Uh, we're actually going to use this type of a little dictionary search uh, in part of the project, the next project that I'm starting. You know, it's one of the reasons that it was on my mind is that I wanted to be able to have a set of phone numbers inside of essentially a directory uh, on, on the microcontroller, we'll call it a dictionary, that will be correlated when someone types in the right phone number to a song. So I'm gonna be working on this dial-a-song. Uh, and so this dictionary structure is a really good way to be able to um, store little pairs of items that go together. Uh, Toddbot says, I just want free cake. No, I just want more coffee. Uh, already polished off this cup. Mike P says, dictionaries are cool to use as function maps too. Oh, please discuss that in the chat. Sounds interesting. Uh, this is a local, uh, local Burbank coffee roaster called Fat Rabbit. Uh, it's the beans that I'm having here today. In case you were wondering, not sponsored. Uh, all right, let's see. What else have we got? So, uh, I want to do a little bit of a um, wrap up of the rotary phone uh, USB 
project that we started on last week, show kind of where, where things have gotten with that. And then we're gonna sort of launch into this next, uh, next project. So one thing actually, I'm curious in the chat because I can't remember, how far did we get with that last week? I know I took apart the phone, showed how it worked. I, I think I may have had it hooked up to a microcontroller that was doing some of the dialing. Um, <clears throat> but I can't remember and I didn't have time to go back and check. So the main stuff I was working on after the show, beyond code, I, did, I think I did make some changes to code uh, that I'll demo and talk about. Uh, but the main things were just the physical layout of uh, the uh, microcontroller inside of the phone, the wiring, and I also wanted to show how I've made this essentially a reversible, non-destructive modification to the phone. Uh, because if you have an old rotary phone like, uh, like that one right there, you may not want to go destroying it. And so uh, I took extra care to make sure that this is a reversible type of hack. Um, the very first part of that actually was building this cable. I showed it on uh, show and tell last night and this is a RJ11, uh, your sort of standard phone uh, jack into USB-A. And that's because I'm using a uh, computer on one end, microcontroller that's inside of the phone on the other. And rather than just running a micro, uh, sorry, running a uh, USB cable into there, it's USB-C in this case, um, and needing to either drill a hole or bypass some stuff, uh, I wanted to use the existing jack. So, so part of this was actually building this cable um, by paying attention to which wires uh, were colored what in the different standards and then running that into the phone. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and actually jump over there. And we will uh, pull this apart to take a look at how I've hooked things up. Turn on the light over here. And uh, then that'll be perfect because I need to start documenting some of that, uh, excuse me, some of that build process for the guide. So I actually am going to work on that after the show. And so I, I'm in need of taking it apart right now. Sometimes, as you know, I've told you I document things by taking, uh, taking them apart and then just reverse the order of the photos. Um, but instead, this time, I'll be taking this apart here on the show, and then I'll put it back together and document it later. Uh, some, of, some of the build included shaving a little bit off of the PVC insulation on this cable to fit, uh, fit the USB uh, DIY jack that we have there. Okay, so... One second, what I'm gonna do is bring up my Discord, if it'll allow me to. Just so I keep an eye on the chat, there we go. Uh, get that right over there. Okay, so, handset, I'm not doing anything with it in this project as far as uh, the electronics of it. However, it does matter that it weighs a whole bunch, enough to keep that spring-loaded switch in place, right? So this is sometimes called the switch hook, receiver switch. So that switch being down in that state, um, I'm using this as a uh, switch to turn on and off the, the USB HID um, protocol of the microcontroller. So what I'll do is, uh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll demo this here. So let me, let me go to notepad. Uh, and I think you've seen me demo this a bit before, but there we go one last time. You can see I've got various phone uh, outlet parts sitting here. So I've got this iPad and uh, this cable here. This terminates in USB-A, but I'll go ahead and plug that into one of these uh, on-the-go camera connectors for iPad. that in there, uh, and then the other end of my RJ11 jack goes into the phone. Okay, so what should just have happened, uh, and I don't know if you can see it, there's a green light you can just see right here. Uh, so that tells me that the microcontroller is on, it's got power, uh, and if it's in its non-USB state, the NeoPixel is green. 
when it goes into its USB HID state, uh, the LED will turn red. So I can see that from under there as sort of a diagnost diagnostic, but I probably don't need to because what should happen is when I lift this off the receiver, it will do a, uh, it'll set a variable and, uh, in the boot.py file, and then it'll set a microcontroller reset so that, that when it restarts, it looks at the boot.py file and it says either I'm in the mode where I'm going to turn on USB HID or I'm in the mode where I'm not. So the practical effect of that should be when this turns on and goes into HID mode, the um, virtual keyboard goes away. Let's see. Let's see if it started. Maybe it didn't. Let me, re let me restart this. Hello. Wake it up. Give it a moment. Uh oh, did I break something? I hope not. I see green LEDs in there. It is not switching to red. Uh oh. This worked so well. Let's, you know what, let's, uh, let's pull its power entirely from here. Plug it back in. There it goes. Okay. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, so this is uh, it starting up in this state, checking, finding out it's going to be a USB HID device. Uh, now it'll work just as a keypad. So we're counting pulses. We counted 10 pulses, gave us a zero. Counts eight pulses, gives us an eight. Um, now, if I hang it up, either with this or just a switch, uh, it will reset itself and check and see, oh, I'm in non-HID state. Not only does it, as you can see, bring up this keyboard, but this has no impact uh, because it's not writing out HID. Internally, the microcontroller is actually still counting those pulses, and it'll print that out to a serial port if you have it connected. Um, but for the sort of usefulness on an iOS device. I don't really want that virtual keyboard uh, there when I'm doing rotary dial, and I want to bring back the rotary or the virtual keyboard when I hang this up. So that's how that's working. Uh, so let me switch back over to Discord, set this here. Uh, so let's get that out of the way, and I don't need this. And to take this apart, it's actually just two screws that you loosen. So pull these right here. By the way, I mentioned this last night on Show and Tell. I am going to implement one different mode, which is instead of using the uh, switch hook there as the mode selector, I'm going to leave it available as an alternate form of dialing because everyone likes. Uh, likes to practice their switch hook dialing. So if you needed to dial a three, you could do three like that as long as your timing is pretty tight uh, and it's definitely possible. Uh, you can you can use the switch hook for that. Okay, so the shell here comes off. Nothing's connected to it. Uh, and so here are the key things before I pull the uh, dial off for you to look at is Here is the existing RJ11 uh, jack that was on this phone, and it actually was only three wire. I added the, uh, the conductor, the fourth wire conductor here with, with just a piece of black wire uh, with a little bit of uh, springy metal on the end that I pulled from a different phone. Um, so those three that were existing in there were um, using these little terminal uh, spade connectors to connect up to some of these screws. I took a picture of it. I can put them back to, to where they were. Um, but that means I'm essentially uh, bypassing the entire tr sort of transmitting uh, uh, block here uh, that has some of the um, phone's electronics that are usually powered by like 40 volts AC. Uh, so we're ignoring that. And this is running essentially straight to the microcontroller, almost straight to the microcontroller as a... Um, HID, or rather, is a USB cable. So it's four conductors. Uh, it does the data plus, data minus, ground, and VCC. Um, and 
then everything else is the uh, wiring that comes from the dial itself is going to the microcontroller so that we can read um, the pulse pin. There's one switch on here that's closing and opening. Uh, and the switch hook. So those are uh, a couple sets of wires that I've connected to the microcontroller indirectly. Uh, and so the reason I did it indirectly is I didn't want to cut anything. I didn't want to solder anything directly to the board. Um, so I used a barrier block, which is a very similar type of screw terminal as what you see already in the phone here. Um, and just loosen this. And this is clipped in with a little mount like so. Loosen this one just a little bit more so that it can get out of there. Okay, so the dial always had these four wires coming off of it. Uh, and those, you can see actually two of them are still going to the phone's uh, original. These two white wires, those are the, um, essentially the switch that is uh, normally open and it closes as soon as you start dialing. That's the disconnect that tells the, um, uh, cuts the speaker that you're listening to in the, uh, in the uh, handset, so you're not hearing all that loud uh, dialing noise. So that switch I've left alone. That could be another one, interesting one to use for something, but I'm not. Um, and then the blue wire is headed to my microcontroller. There's the little KB2040. And like I said, everything, all the wiring I've done here uh, is this little barrier block. So you can see my RJ11, the three original uh, cables on there, the green, red, and yellow that normally go somewhere over here. They come up to this block and then I have some wires running to my KB2040 that I've soldered in place. And then here I match the colors of these. So these are the two blue wires coming off of the pulse dial. Those just run to two blue wires that are going to ground, and I believe I'm reading that on the RX pin. And then finally the switch hook here, I've uh, screwed in a couple wires to where that connects inside of the phone, uh, going to these white and black wires on the, the terminal block or barrier block, and then uh, those are going to another ground and pin two. And I could have ganged up some of these grounds, but I just wanted to keep it sort of one-to-one -one and, and clear. Um, so that, thankfully, I, I could cut this down if I had to, but that block actually fits kind of perfectly right in this little space right here. Uh, everything still functions uh, mechanically as normal. There's, there's space there. Uh, I haven't mounted this. There's actually not a, uh, no mounting holes on the KB2040 since it's, it was designed to just be soldered down onto uh, keyboard PCBs. So I've just put down a piece of black felt here, uh, sticky back black felt, to keep this from having to short on anything. If I could improve this a lot. <laughs> uh, maybe put some Kapton tape back there and uh, mount this with a zip tie or something else to the some of these holes in the bottom of the phone that aren't used for anything. Um, excuse me. The uh, RJ, sometimes I think these are given like the name RJ8, um, is the usually two wire, um, is that right? No, usually four wire, uh, but I think it's a smaller plug, narrower plug for the mic and the, um, the earpiece. Those could be used for something as well, so um, we're gonna look at that on the upcoming project using the, uh, the microphone or the speaker, uh, probably the speaker, by wiring in through there. So, uh, but that's, that's another interesting part there. Uh, and then lastly, people ask about the um, uh, ringer on these. And that's actually a really, it's a, it's a tricky thing. So this is a, um, I think the ringer voltage goes from 60 volts to 80 volts. And it's a uh, sinusoidal, it's like a pair of sinusoidal signals that the phone company would send down the line that would um, trigger 
I think this is a dual coil, and so it would magnetically pull and push this little uh, clapper here. Um, so it's nothing that you can just you know send three volts to or five volts to uh, to fake it. So um, I might look into building. There's some good square wave circuits out there and uh, boost converters that people use to ring these, especially in theatrical settings. If you look, there's like a sort of homemade looking hundred dollar gizmo you can buy that uh, is a, uh, a phone ringer for for theatrical stuff. And those will usually just ring while you hold them and stop ringing when you when you release. So then they also sell like a second box that has the timing that's the two seconds on, one second off, uh, or, or maybe vice versa of a uh, of an American ring, and it's and it's different in different countries. Um, so anyway, that's like a different thing that I'm not handling. But just in case you were curious, one of the reason is that uh, yeah, there's a, there was a lot of. Uh, voltage going down the line is still with a with the pots plain old telephone system uh so it runs normally at, i think 48 volts the ringing is uh yeah someone says 90 to 120 normally 96 um yeah so if you look around you'll see different different phone systems implement it uh with with some pretty high voltages uh so this one i will be documenting so you can go out there and and find an old phone in your closet and and build one of these if you want um, I'm just going to set a couple pieces back there so it's not too big of a mess and get this out of the way. And then I'd like to, uh, start talking about our next project. So I'm going to move that one right there. Uh, and we'll head over. Yes. Uh, C. Grover says ringing spikes could easily light a small neon indicator bulb. You'll find, uh, phones. Hey, is this thing still plugged in? Probably not. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, you will find phones in the, I think in the 500 series era and definitely in the 2500 series era that had a big neon indicator bulb, like a, you know, stove indicator type of bulb. Maybe, I don't know if they were 12 volts or what, 30 volts, but uh, you'd, you'd find them in these beautiful um, domed refractors, usually red, so that it could be seen. Uh, so someone who had the ringer turned off could see the phone flashing. Uh, so that was high, high voltage stuff to, to make all that work. It's pretty cool. All right, let me put a, uh, oh good, I'm glad to see there's a, there's a nice discussion going on about uh, dictionaries and functions that I'll check out later. Hey, foamy guy, thanks for stopping by. Uh, so the next project is highly related because um, it's sort of unavoidable once you start looking at the, the 500 series phones to then think about the evolution into dual tone multifunction or touch tone dialing, which is usually some kind of a keypad like this. And uh, the idea with this project is to use the keypad as an input device to enter in a phone number, a sort of fake seven digit phone number, and then have a self-contained dial-a-song in the phone so that when you pick up the receiver, punch in a number, if it is a phone number on the list in the dictionary uh, that has an associated song with it, it'll play back a song to you over the headset. So that'll be a probably a wave file that I'll put on there. And a uh, heavy, heavy nod to They Might Be Giants, who pioneered way back in, I guess, the mid-'80s, uh, a dial a song service where you could call up a phone number and get uh, get a song played to you. So the first step in this, however, is just the uh, the sort of keypad side of things. So let me bring back uh, this view of the world. So what I've got here for this is kind of my first uh, phase of this process is okay. I know with the phone I have a really good chance of encountering a matrix layout, uh, probably a three by four matrix layout. Uh, a lot of phones are actually a 4x4, four four, and they hide the, the right row of them, which were A, B, C, D, I think. Um, and actually, Adafruit sells a keypad that has that, that layout on it. Those were sort of a hidden set of tones that were used for government use and military use. Um, and I don't know if that's, I, I kind of don't know if that's still in use at all. Some of these systems have to stick around for legacy reasons, but uh, good chance you'll find a, a matrix. And so... This is a little uh, non-diode, so just a straight-up matrix uh, keypad that we have at Adafruit. And uh, in fact, I'll, I'll pull those up real quick. Where's my 
browser. So if you look on uh, Adafruit and go to keypad, you'll find, here's a four by four. So that's like this uh, sort of uh, bonus government, US government version of, of the, the dual tone multifunction. Uh, and then we have the three by four keypad. The one that I'm using is actually the three by four phone style keypad, which is, I think it's a little bit different where the connectors are, but functionally it's the same. It's just that this one has the um, uh, numbers printed on it that relate to some of, or the letters that, that relate to some of the numbers which were used for dialing, you know, 1-800-thingy or whatever. Please don't call that. I don't know if that was enough letters. Um, yeah, Wagon Loads over in YouTube says, uh, phones also used for escape room challenges. These are such great input devices for escape room challenges, definitely. Um, so to use this, I'm going to jump back over here and let me plug this in and show you what my kind of first order of business with this is knowing that I wanted to use CircuitPython because it's going to make it really easy to play back WAV files directly from uh, a, a microcontroller such as the Feather. And uh, you know what, I can turn up the exposure on here real quick. Whoop, that's a little better. Zoom out. Uh, so this was kind of a neat happenstance that I was able to use one of these Feather triplers so I have a Feather RP2040 here. I have a, an OLED Feather Wing here. And then there are, uh, I think, what does this one have? Eight pins coming out of this, even though it's really only seven that are used. Um, and these pins I was able to plug into the bottom, essentially going into the A0, A1, A2, A3, pin 24, pin 25, uh, and serial clock pins. Use them all as digital I.O. pins for uh, columns and rows. And so that plugged in there. I also used some little uh, standoffs to, little two, uh, M2.5 standoffs to make it a little bit sturdier. Uh, so let me give you a little demo of this. I'll go to a full screen for a moment. So right now it boots up and it says dial a tune and then it gives you a bit of a clue as to you're supposed to type in a seven digit phone number just by doing uh, underscores and a dash. So if I type something in, uh, 555-1212, right now what I've got it doing is recognizing that you're typing in numbers, uh, adding those into uh, or or, or, uh, uh, appending those to a uh, list, and then when it reaches seven, it uh, checks that number to see if it's part of of an existing uh, dictionary. So you'll see if I type the next number, it recognizes seven digits, and then it doesn't matter what those seven digits are right now, uh, it kind of rolls it over, refreshes everything, and waits for you to, to do the next one. Uh, so let me show this in the code view, uh, and I've got some somewhat helpful uh, print statements in here. So let's see that one I can close. And let me open up the one on here. Hey, where are you? Why aren't you showing up? One second. Hmm. I'm going to unplug it and replug it because that board didn't show up. All right, Uh, I wonder if I have a, let's try a different USB cable. Yeah, all right, that other cable's a little suspicious. There we go, sorry about that. So uh, first of all, let's take a look just in my serial output here. Uh, So I will use screen to connect to this feather here. And now let's start typing numbers. So I've typed in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so you see I'm printing out the string that is being appended, or the list, the string version of this list that's being appended uh, until it gets to that seventh digit. 
then I kind of repeat it. I say, okay, the dialed string is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in this case. Uh, and then I'm printing to myself, the number you've dialed is not in service. So that's going to be what I'll do if a number is typed in that does not exist in the list uh, or in the dictionary or the phone directory for the dial a song is that I'll play back a wave file of the sort of typical doo -doo -doo, the number you have called is not in service. Um, which I haven't heard in a while, so I don't know if, I'm, if I've got that exactly right. But uh, the um, let me let me show you how uh, how what happens when we dial one that that is in the list. So I've got uh, a number that is, and now you'll see I'm just printing the name of a, a wave file, a fake wave file that doesn't exist yet. So I don't actually have this. Uh, I don't have any waves on here. I don't have a uh, amp and a speaker or anything like that connected. Uh, so for now, I'm just kind of printing things out to know that it's working. Um, so let's take a look at the code and how this works. The uh, display stuff is pretty typical for using this OLED display, so I won't go over that in great detail. Um, I squared C is how we're connecting to that display. I am using our uh, text label, uh, display -O label, to create the little dial -a tune uh, up, at the up at the top there and uh, then a second little uh, text area that's initially these dashes, uh, underscores and dashes. Uh, and then I'm using the uh, keypad library. So you'll see up here one of, the, one of the things I'm importing is import keypad. So the keypad library is being created, the object uh, km for key matrix, equals keypad.keymatrix. And then you specify the rows and the columns. It doesn't actually matter which you put first, uh, as long as you name them that way. So row pins equals uh, board pins A3, D24, D25, and serial clock. And then the column pins are pins A0, A1, and A2. Um, so that is reading, uh, reading this, this matrix, uh, or setting it up to, to read that matrix. Uh, then I'm setting up my... Uh, dictionary here. So remember I talked about dictionaries earlier, so I have a dictionary called numbers, and I could probably be more descriptive with that, like phone book or something like that. And then when a number uh, exists, we have an associated value to its key. So the, the phone number you dial in will be the key, and the uh, WAV file we play back will be the value. I also gave the buttons some nice names uh, since these are technically event 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, in fact, if I just print event, and you can see here event is uh, the key matrix dot events dot get. So we do a we do a check of all of the, the keys in this, in the library. Uh, so when I press a key, I get a event key number. So that's essentially this zero through uh, 13 uh, event numbers that exist in the matrix. And when I release, I get a released value of that same key. So you can see this is neat because we can type for other uses, not for the, for the one we're doing here. We can press a four press the three, release the three, uh, release the uh, two, or rather. Uh, so it knows the, this sort of edge detection of if you press something or released it, which is useful. Not in this project, though. I don't really need it for much. Um, so to be able to uh, press what is essentially zero, key event zero, but see a one show up, or to press key event, uh, what is this one, 12, and get a zero to show up, I have a little uh, list here that I can remap things to. So um, I'm not printing them on the screen, but you can see when I type in the star or the pound sign right now, those are showing up in my, in my uh, serial output. So I have a nice name, essentially, with this button names list. Uh, then I have a, uh, I have this, variable called digits entered, and that's what's keeping track of have we gotten all the way through the seven uh, digits of a phone number yet, and then we do stuff when we've reached that, that limit. Uh, dialed is the list of the 
digits that are being entered. So this dialed equals brackets thing means it's essentially a list that has nothing in it to start with. Um, and then as we press things, we're going to append to that list and build that list up to be seven digits long. Uh, right now you can see I'm not doing much of anything with these star and uh, pound keys, but I may end up using those for stuff if we have an operator saying something to you. Would you like to play the song again? Press star to continue, that kind of thing. Uh, then I'll have those available as sort of little additional functions. Um, you could get ambitious with this. I'm going to make it fairly simple, but you could say, you know what, I want to do stuff like if I'm holding down star, I can cycle between A, B, and C, and the number 2, A, B, C, 2, and that sort of thing. Uh, you may remember that from your flip phone days of being able to uh, toggle through those, those letter options and then maybe search for a song by name or something like that. Uh, I won't touch that, but that'll certainly be possible for someone who wants to. Uh, and then here's what's going on inside of the main loop. First, coffee. Uh, hello, Abu Awad and Jared Mannering. Nice to see you all. Thanks for stopping into the chat there over on YouTube. Um, <laughs> see Grover's am amused to see Jenny at the top of the list there. Uh, and yeah, uh, Todd says, the keypad libraries make this stuff so much easier. Thank you, Dan Halbert, Dan H., who wrote this, uh, this excellent keypad library inside of CircuitPython. Oh yeah, press star to list all songs. I love that. That's great. Um, so here's what's going on in the main events, uh, or the, the main loop. So event equals key matrix events get. And if you look at the key matrix documentation for that library, in fact, let's, let's take a journey over there real quick. Um, all you got to do is head to learn.adafruit.com and if you type in keypad, uh, you'll see, just look for a SNES controller. Uh, Dan has this photo with a SNES controller, a keypad, and a um, macro pad. So the uh, guide We'll tell you all about how it works. We can read keys, key matrices, and shift registers, which is what you find in that uh, SNES controller. Uh, it talks about a simple setup for just checking for key presses, uh, like a GPIO pin. Uh, it talks about the key matrix, both with and without a diode uh, matrix in it. The setup for those, being able to switch their orientation, uh, pick, pick the orientation of the diode matrix if it is one, and so forth. Um, and then there's some examples you can look through that'll, that'll give you some ideas. And there's the advanced features, which will talk about um, some intervals of scanning. Different keyboards might have a different scan uh, uh, interval that you have to account for. Um, filling up a queue with a bunch of keys uh, and so on. So uh, check this out. You can also check out the uh, Read the Docs documentation for other uh, functions there. And I think we can also uh, just import the library onto the board and uh, type directory for the, for the uh, keypad and see what it can do. So uh, back to this. You saw me add this print event. This is really helpful to have at first because I didn't get the, the pin assignments right at first. And so I was pressing a 1 and seeing it say key event 8. And, you know, it was sideways and backwards. So the first thing you have to do is just figure out by reading key events which pins are proper. Or this is, you know, you might be able to figure it out looking at the, um, the clear backing on here or pull this off and, and check the traces. Uh, but I just found it easier through trial and error to uh, swap the, these around and uh, use that, that uh, print event to see what was being pressed. Uh, and then when an event happens, so there's if the event when the event happens, if it's pressed, I'm actually not, not doing anything with released. Um, and maybe I should, but this is how I'm doing it right now. With the press of an event, then I do a, a kind of a first level check, which is, is it the star or the pound key or hash key that's been pressed? Um, so either of those it's only going to do what's inside of this loop first. So if the event is pressed, if the event is either key number 9 or key number 11, so uh, I was saying that wrong before, this is 0 through 11, 
Uh, if we are pressing either of those, then all I do is, if it's key 9, the star key, I run this pad clear function, which right now doesn't do much. It just prints out uh, a little print statement for me here. Uh, so that doesn't count to our total as we're adding up towards 7. It doesn't put anything on the screen uh, because after this runs, uh, the next thing at that level is repeat the whole loop. Um, and same with this. So, so these kind of don't contribute to the rest of the stuff. Uh, so what the rest of the stuff is, any other key. So 1 through 9 and 0. If the digit that is entered is, uh, or rather, yeah, if the digits entered variable or list is, uh, yeah, it's a variable, it's not a list, sorry. If that is less than 7, then that means we're going to add a number to this potential phone number. Uh, if it's up to 7, then we know we've entered a phone number, we do other stuff. So this section right here, this is all just about um, building up the list of, of the, the full phone number. So if the event is a key number uh, less than 9, uh, so event key number less than 9, then it is these uh, right here. And in those cases, I just append that event key number plus one since this starts at zero. So if I press this event zero, it's actually a one that gets added to my dialed uh, number list. So the dialed number list is what you see growing there. So one, 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 one. And in fact, I'm going to hide the uh, event print here real quick. So I press a one and another one, and another one, or something else. So that's building up that, um, that list. So I um, add to that. If it's a 10, then I just type in a 0. So you can see there I'm, I'm correlating to a 0. Um, I create a string, which makes it easier to do things like print to the screen here. Uh, so this dialed string equals a empty string plus join string n for n in dialed. So each item in that dialed list um, becomes uh, a, essentially a character in this string. Then the number text area uh, OLED display grabs uh, and prints this dialed string that's being built up, uh, appended to. And then I'm also printing it down here in my serial output just for me to see. I don't need that. That print statement, in fact, none of those print statements go to the screen. Those are just for debugging right now. Uh, and then the digits entered equals whatever the digits entered is plus one. And so that's how we go from zero up to uh, six, which is the seven digits. So if the number of digits entered is seven, uh, then I'm sure there's a neater way to do this, uh, but I wanted to add the, the hyphen in there. Uh, so I'm just doing this um, messy iterating through each item or each index in the list until I get to the third number, then I put in a hyphen, and then I put in the remaining four. So I'm sure there's a, a cleaner way to do that that I'll, that I'll have to look at later. Um, same thing here, the dialed string uh, gets printed. Uh, and then here's the check. So remember earlier in the CircuitPython Parsec segment, I was looking at checking for a key inside of a dictionary and then returning the value. So my dictionary in this case is numbers. And the key that I'm looking to see, does it exist, is this dialed string. So my dialed string, uh, in this case, is 1112011. So it goes up here. It checks this dictionary. Are either of these entries, uh, do either of these entries have a key that is 1112011? They do not. Uh, so in this case, if the string is not inside of that dictionary, then we print the numbers you've dialed. It's not in service, since that's what we see right now. Uh, if I do my childhood phone number, uh, which I don't use for passwords anywhere, so don't, don't worry. That's not, uh, not bad infosec, I hope. Uh, if I type that in, then that one does exist. And uh, so it says, OK, we'll give you back the value, which is that pair with the key will give you back that value uh, by grabbing the dictionary of numbers and the key of dialed string. So it grabs the value. In this case, the value is uh, file2.wave. So you can see it up here. 
file2.wave is the wave file correlated to that phone number. Uh, if instead I do Jenny's number, 8675309, then we get file1.wave. Uh, so next step will be to actually use some uh, wave playback code in here or MP3 playback code in here uh, and have it do something with it. And there's a lot of UI stuff that I can do, like do we want to clear that out after each one, put a different message, have something uh, like the song name show up. Um, that's, that's some stuff that remains to be done. Uh, then, since this was all inside of the loop of if digits entered is seven, that means when we've hit that, uh, that last number in the seven digit sequence, we do whatever we do, print stuff, find out that that number exists, play a song, uh, find out that that number didn't exist, play the that doesn't exist message, and then I just reset everything. So the digits entered gets dropped back to zero, the dialed uh, list becomes empty, and the dialed string becomes empty. Uh, so that's, that's what just sort of sets us up uh, to be able to, to start again. Um, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a great point. Uh, don't let me forget this. The uh, Seagrove says add touch tone wave files for the key presses. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. So as each number gets pressed, we'll hear the boop, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop, beep uh, happening when we press those. Um, I don't see any reason not to make them WAV files. I think I mentioned this before. It's, it's possible, potentially, on, uh, on this microcontroller. I'm using a Feather RP2040. It's possible that I could play um, two uh, waveforms simultaneously to actually make dual tone multifunction. Um, and, and I've talked about this before on the show, so I won't go into it. But essentially, each column played one of three different uh, waveforms and each, uh, or each row and each column played one of four. And so it's a mix of those, it was dual tone. It was two tones happening at once. Um, yeah, and also dial tone dot wave. We wanna have when we pick that up, uh, we'll, hear, we'll hear the, uh, the line is open kind of thing. Lots of fun phone stuff we can do there. Uh, <laughs> that's right, Abadus, that, that is the culturally required way to say the, uh, the phone number. Um, okay, okay, movie phone we could implement, that's a good idea. So uh, let's see, at this point what I wanted to do is just jump over and we have some excellent uh, just-in-time delivery because I didn't have a good Model 2500 um, phone. I have some touch-tone phones. But I'll show you the issue. Um, this is one that I got at a thrift store for eight dollars. Uh, you can see I've started to take it apart. Uh, so this is probably, I don't know, modern-ish. This might be in the last 10, 15 years phone, AT&T two-line phone. It was probably worth a, a good bit of money when it originally came out. Uh, but if you look at this, here's what we've got to deal with. Uh, probably microcontroller in here, talking to microcontroller in here, maybe not a lot of uh, fun trying to hook into this matrix. You probably could, but I, I don't love this phone and uh, it's got no style. It has no soul. So. Uh, another, actually a nicer touch tone that I have, I've, I've shown, I think I've shown some projects with this one before, um, is this little one here. This is kind of nice. Zoom out a little bit. Uh, but not a lot of room in here. And so what I really wanted was the uh, successor to the Model 500, which was the Model 2500. And just before the show, this came uh, in the mail. I know I could have probably gotten one locally, but I didn't have a lot of time, so I got one off of eBay. I paid $16 for it plus shipping, so not too bad. Um, and this is a beautiful beige, genuine Western Electric Model 2500. All right there, Model 2500 DM. Property of Pacific Telephone Company, not for sale. Uh, like I've mentioned before, these phones were usually rented to you from your phone company for about 30 bucks a month. You didn't own them. Uh, 
And you still run across news stories sometimes about uh, people who are who have still been renting their phones, you know, 30, 40 years later, they're still a grandparent or something who's paying the phone company for a, uh, a phone rental, which they've probably paid for the phone by now, I would guess. So this one we will end up using uh, speaker in here, uh, which will be two of the wires coming off of here. Usually if you take the mouthpiece out, you can see the wiring. Let's see. So there you can see is the uh, jack running into it. And then you can even tell thanks to the color coding, uh, there's a red and a black looks like running to this mic and there's a white and a green running up to the speaker in here. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to drive that using just one of our little class D mono uh, amplifiers. We'll see. I don't know what the I don't know what the specifications are for these speakers up here. Uh, oh, it looks like yeah. Okay, so you can see they usually stuffed some batting in here, synthetic batting or cotton batting. Um, so there's some batting in there. I think that mostly just keeps these wires from rattling around and gives it a little bit of a, um, a deadening of sound. So there's our speaker. If anyone wants to do some research on that, based on those numbers on there, uh, or if someone just knows off the top of their head what would be a good amp to drive that with, that would be part of that. Um, yeah, and the contrasting brown faceplate. Isn't that gorgeous? I love that. Uh, Pretty clean too, it's in pretty good shape. I <clears throat> can take off the um, face plate there just by lifting up this clip. There's like a little metal clip that's spring loaded. And once you push that upward into the phone, you can pull this off. I don't know why they made that that easy to pop off. It seems like it was for for the purposes of changing this out rapidly before you brought it to a customer or something like that. Uh, but nice molded colored, uh, it's not paint or anything, nice color molded plastic. And it has a little um, face, little little uh, clear protector there for dropping in a piece of paper with the phone number. Uh, it's usually what you put in there. And these often got little stickers stuck on them with like 911 when that was first introduced or you know choking hotline or something like that. You'll see that a lot on phones. Uh, the number pad there, you can see, by the way, I think this is a double shot plastic, which is great. You're never gonna wear this off. It's not like it's printed on there or dye sublimated or anything like that. That's, I think that's a uh, double shot plastic. So there's two molds um, and two squirts of plastic that go in. So uh, nice quality stuff. These are built to last. So. Let's open it up and have a look at the uh, wiring for the matrix there. I have not opened this phone yet, so uh, <clears throat> anyone's guess what we're gonna find inside. I need some torque on this screw. So you can see how closely this resembles the uh, 500. They didn't want to change that design much. Uh, really, they were taking a uh, device you were comfortable with and introducing this touch tone dial pad technology, but leaving the rest of it the same, including the ringer here. Uh, and actually, that's something I haven't played around with. I, I need to build a, a ringing circuit, like I said. I don't actually know what the what that changes, what that volume, if it's a dampener or what. What is that? That It's a big mechanical knob for the volume, and I don't know if they're just dampening a bell or what. I don't think it changed the frequency. All right. Here we go. Moment of truth. I don't 
don't see any little animals or anything in there. That's a good sign. Hey, this is pretty clean. Not bad. Uh, let's set that right there. So familiar positioning of dial, uh, ringer rather, the uh, little um, communication block here uh, is shorter, but again, kind of placed in the same position there. Uh, see, Grover says it's a mechanical dampener usually. Let's see. It looks like it rotates that bell there, which is funny. How that quiets it, I don't know. I believe you that it's a me mechanical dampener, but I don't know how that would dampen it. Is it just further from the clapper? I think it is. Yeah, this thing is, uh, isn't that funny? This is actually offset a little bit, and so the dampener, uh, the uh, this, this one bell is getting further or closer. Weird. Uh, so, what we want to do, boy, it's, it's really cool how similar this is to the 500. So what I want to do is loosen these two screws on the side of the dial pad. Um, and see if it'll clip out. on each side. Uh, I think, you know, one question is, did any of these have different color keypads? I think they did, because I, I, I think I've seen all black we had all black. Uh, I think the, there are red ones where the numbers are red on it, but then I think maybe this gray went on a bunch of different, they I don't know if they color matched the tan or the white. They might have all had gray in there. Okay. So next phase of the operation, you can see there is quite a bit more uh, wiring headed from here to the rest of the phone than on the, uh, the Model 500. Uh, there are, let's see if we can pull this. Ooh, that's taped down. Okay, so that'll, that'll have to be a little more careful with. And I'm not gonna try to hook up to this today. I wanna, I wanna probe around. That'll be a little bit tedious uh, to figure out what the row column matrix is. I also haven't looked this up online because I'm sure there are people who've gone before me to figure out what, uh, what if it's any of these wires for the row column matrix or uh, how we tap into that or if I have to dig deeper in. Um, but interesting that we've got what look like some little uh, switches here. And, oh, wow. Yeah, look at this. This is a mechanical switching system. So I'm pressing different keys and I suspect those are doing this, maybe they're doing the same disconnect uh, of the earpiece because you can see that there are contacts being made and broken here as we press. Uh, this is really cool. I've never dug, dug into this uh, keypad before, so this will be fun. Uh, Seagrove says, old phones are a great example of rugged consumer design, built to be abused, but uh, <laughs> used as a weapon in a few episodes of Perry Mason. Yeah, these are uh, incredibly robust, made to, to last, made to be repaired. Um, very cool. All right, so that's, yeah, that's, that surprised me. I didn't think we would see mechanical switching in there. I, I got to assume there is... Um, dual tone multifunction row and column stuff happening as well as whatever this disconnect and reconnect. This is not a different uh, sequence based on different numbers here. So this, those are all kind of doing that same uh, set of connections uh, back to the phone. So, All right. Uh, I think I'll leave it there, but I will uh, 
keep you appraised of, of the discoveries as they go. Uh, sorry, I didn't give you a big view of that. That would have been nice. Uh, so here you can see. Look at that right there. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, so there's just two pieces of tape that are holding this little insulator plastic, which I don't know why I made it clear. To be honest, it's great that they did, but why is that clear plastic? I don't know. Maybe it was just the best plastic to vacuum form into this shape. Uh, it was clear. Maybe it was for maintenance, assembly, who knows? All right. Uh, if you've got experience with these, let me know in the chat or if you found good uh, guides to that. That's what I'll be, one of the things I'll be searching uh, next is how those are, uh, how we can hook into that, uh, into that system and read those, uh, those key presses. Uh, yes, wagon loads, you're right. Change the distance between the ringer and the bell. That's exactly what it does. That's very cool. Love it. All right, uh, I think that's gonna do it for today. Thanks everyone for stopping by to the workshop. Uh, look in the next uh, few days for the rotary phone uh, USB numpad uh, guide that I'll be working on and then we'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be sure to post to you on the progress with this uh, as I find out more and get, the, uh, get a microcontroller to read that. Thanks everyone for stopping by for Adafruit Industries. I'm John Park and this has been John Park's workshop. Bye-bye.